yesterday I realized that my title is a little bit misleading uh, because the uh, talk is not about the kind of linguistic signification and how voice attains uh, meaning through language, but uh, more on the kind of unlikely methodological connections and inner workings and mechanisms between the two works. Um, Mechanism of Speech by Alexander Graham Bell and the long uh, artistic, linguistic, and pre-architectural project um, Mechanism of Meaning by the artist uh, Duora Cavangins. Um, so the word mechanism highlights the diagrammatic character of the operations, the kind of spatial-temporal relations of the production of sound and the production of meaning that are abstracted in both works. So the unlikely connection that I, I refer to is that both works were heavily inspired by the figure of uh, Helen Keller, uh, that, as I would argue, made that mechanism, both mechanisms kind of visible because of her non-normative production and perception of sound that resulted in her shedding light in the embodied ways language framed the world. So in, in summary, what I'll do is I'll try to unpack the speciality that is intrinsic to the production, perception, and consumption of sound that problematizes the givenness of human perception and demonstrates how language and signification is both uh, embodied and embedded in an environment, so it has a body, and it is as well an action, not something that it's there already. Uh, and I will begin with uh, by describing a different kind of situatedness um, with this quote, house isn't so much a sound as a situation. And this is how Terry Tamlitz begins their musical and discursive uh, kind of genealogical exploration and critique onto contemporary deep house as a music industry that com is completely removed from the material conditions of its production, dissemination, and consumption. So Tamlitz suggests that um, uh, the mentions of a universal love or feeling or united revolution or some kind of like harmonious community that answers the question, what is house? Nowadays, completely sanitizes the dairy and problematic beginnings of the genre. So in a public lecture in Amsterdam last year, Timlitz described how TJ Sprinkles, their boy drag uh, TJ persona, evolved through the queer trans scene of the 80s New York. The music was called house because every club uh, always associated with a hyper-specific queer subscene had its own uh, house record collection. So the TJ would not bring their own selection, but rather have to work with what was available in the house. Also house referred to the ballroom culture that often accompanied, accompanied these spaces. So in a way, uh, house could not describe the musical genre as there was never anything that unified the music, except of the same situation. The, kind of, the material conditions of the network of the queer TJs, performance, the club goers in the late 80s and early 90s New York. So it was more of an environment and not the music that framed the genre. Uh, Tamilis argues that therefore, house is hyper-specific. Uh, and that's a quote as well from the um, Town Blues. Uh, house emerged out of uh, sexual and gender crisis, transgender sex work, black market hormones, drug and alcohol addiction, loneliness, racism, HIV, police brutality, queer bashing, underpayment, unemployment, and censorship all at 120 beats per minute. So the conditions of its emergence are thoroughly erased today, uh, and there's no trace of any of these struggles. Even though the context has changed, Timlitz's plea um, is to re recontextualize sonic experiences, or at least not try to sanitize them by making them unproblematic. Timlitz understands how listening is material, and like with every perception, is embodied and embedded within a context. And just like seeing, listening itself, as well as the organs of production and perception of sound, are embodied biologically, technically, and culturally. Our forms of listening, just like our forms of seeing, allow us to identify certain things and obscure others. Our position affects how and what we can perceive. And now moving to kind of the production of sound. Uh, Alexander Melville Bell, which is the father of Alexander, was the father of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, dedicated his life studying and attempting to correct speech impediments uh, through the development of uh, a speech symbol alphabet that represented the vocal organs and the various kinds of arrangements of apertures employed in the production of speech sounds. 
Alexander Graham Bell used his father's alphabet and organized it spatially in order to use it as a tool for teaching deaf children how to speak. So Bell's desire to make silence speak drew him to elaborate on this haptic language system as a spatial assemblage of four bodily systems, the nervous, the respiratory, the laryngeal, and the articulatory system for the production, not just the simulation of voice. Based on his father's symbols, he diagrammatized vocal hapticity, so the and that was the embodied production of speech through spatial conceptualization of the vocal cavities. In the Mechanism of Speech, which is a book and a lecture series under the same name, uh, Bell starts his meditation on vocal hapticity with uh, the following spatial exploration of the vocal cavities. And that's a long quote, but I will read it very slowly. Uh, the thorax is the treasure house of the human body, a veritable strong room, girt about with walls of bone for the protection of those precious organs, the heart and lungs. Let us imagine ourselves for a moment inside the thorax. But first, with your permission, let us empty this safe deposit vault of its valuable contents so that we may have space for exploration. We find ourselves in a dark room or vault with a door in the roof. The floor of this vault, instead of being firm and solid, is a soft membrane or muscle, not flat like an ordinary floor, but dome-shaped like the top of an open umbrella. The door above is a short of double trapdoor, set at an angle instead of being flat, and opening upwards. But the most extraordinary thing about this room is that the floor is in constant motion, having upwards and downwards in regular pulsations. The trap doors also are in motion. Now they are opened so that a glimpse can be obtained of passages above. And now they come together with a quivering motion, opening and shutting with great rapidity and causing a vibration that makes the whole thorax tremble. The walls also are in motion, the whole room alternately increasing and diminishing in size. So the architectural qualities he assigned to the thorax and its diagrammatization led Bell to conceive of a way of allowing deaf children to visualize the vibrations of the air that bounce off our ear eardrums as sound. Indeed, his text is full of spatial and architectural metaphors. For example, um, how the, he talks about how the diaphragm with its kind of dome-like uh, floor turning conical in shape when it contracts. And he kind of uh, makes a metaphor uh, of the Washington Capitol uh, dome turning into a bland uh, Gothic church spire. It's exactly this kind of geometrical abstraction of the mechanism of speech that allowed Bell to conceptualize the operation of the production of sound and think the structure behind it in diagrammatic and spatial terms, therefore making it replicable, anticipating perhaps the invention of the telephone. He visualizes the production of sound as air passing through a series of rooms, an architectural mechanism that is biological, but also parts of whom could be replicated and substituted by prosthetic tools. Uh, in one of his lectures, he mentions the story of a patient who had been supplied with an artificial substitute for the larynx made by dentist rubber. As there were no vocal cords, the man could only speak in a kind of sort of whispery voice and was barely audible. A small opening had been left in the front part of the rubber, a substitute into which the man slipped a metal reed taken from a harmonium or a small parlor organ. Upon then attempting to speak, the reed was thrown into vibration by the air from the lungs and a good sonorous voice resulted, resembling the natural voice to a remarkable degree. And the quality of the human voice, he insisted, was due in a very minor degree to the vocal cords themselves and in much greater degree to the shapes of the passages through which the vibrating column of air is passed. Uh, his writings position the body as a medium and the space that materializes sound into voice by being an enclosure, an echoey cave. The body's resonant interiority, however, uh, it's not separated or detached from the world, but rather the opposite. Enclosures and interiorities hinge on the existence of an exterior. Throughout the history of phenomenology, bodies have always been considered as interiorities, enclosed holes with architecture as their exterior. For Bell, the body is an interiority, a spatial topography around which uh, speech organizes itself. Sound, then, is emitted, modulated, and directed outward through the body's intricate openings to the world. 
uh, theoretician Sarah Ahmed has delved extensively into the speciality of perception, theorizing how orientation, direction, and the ability to realize and perceive one's bodily limits within the world should not be taken as givens. In her book, Queer Phenomenology takes a deviant look at perception and attempts to break down the lived experience of orientation that she defines as a key moment in human perception. In her introduction, she describes how orientation comes to shape worlds and bodies. Uh, so she begins with proprioception, the ability to feel one's sides and kind of sense the environment in order to develop the first uh, sense of direction. Then she refers to the acknowledgement of one's limits and what is ready to hand, that is knowing the body's reach that is constructed through that relationship between body um, and environment. Uh, she then goes to describe the co-shaping of the body and the environment through uh, spatiotemporal refrains. So that is repeated actions and orientation that turn into habits. And this is how the space leaves a map on the body, and that is an imagined map on top of the directly experienced or lived one. And lastly, she concludes with the way perception is processed or consumed. That brings up, this is the way uh, perception brings about uh, consciousness, turning someone's position quite literally into an intention, focusing on the making of meaning and how special perceptions uh, come to matter. Uh, I will go through all these stages of perception by focusing on the figure of Helen Keller and how it reflected on the works of Alexander Graham Bell and later uh, Arakawa and Gins. So in the mechanism of speech, uh, Bell dedicated the chapter, please imitate Helen Keller's voice to the figure of Helen Keller. He applauded her extraordinary ability to speak despite losing her senses of sight and hearing at a very young age before having learned to communicate using language. Bell developed a way to conceptualize sound production not only as being spatial, but also as having an articulated directionality as he compared learning to speak with learning to shoot. In spite of her aptitudes for speaking, Keller was reported uh, to have very little sense of direction or proprioception. For Keller, even understanding the sense of direction was not something that was taken care of automatically as an instinct. She mentioned in her biography um, of not knowing where to aim her voice towards and not having the perceptual grappling to understand the dimension of direction at all. Just like her communication skills, her navigational skills and perceptive organs had to be constructed or rather improvised on the spot in the absence of any reference that she could mimic or learn from. Direction affects what comes into view and together with the configuration of the ground, it produces a horizon for the body that perceives. Uh, Sarah Ahmed suggests that the repetition of a certain direction becomes ingrained into bodies. Uh, and that's a quote from her. It is not then that bodies simply have a direction, or rather they follow directions, in moving this way or that way. Rather, in moving this way rather than that, and moving in this way again and again, the surfaces of bodies in turn acquire their shape. So perception operates as an assemblage of our receptive organs, our intuited actions and our experiences, all of which allow certain things to come into view or recede into the background. As an agglomeration of our senses, perception gives us a direction, suggesting actions as responses to visual, oral, and spatial cues from our environment. If bodies are shaped by the repetition of certain directions, then our sense of perception itself can be conceived as a direction that becomes naturalized through repetition. Uh, Keller perceived all communication as vibration, bringing together the tactile with the auditory. Sound for her was haptic, and therefore voice could not be separated from any other sound, making everything that vibrates uh, resonate for her with a voice-like pulsation. In her autobiography, Keller describes a moment where, by placing her hand on the trunk of a tree, she was able to hear the leaves speaking to each other. Keller's ability to grasp the world, to understand the moment where sound and movement are interlinked, interlinked comes to her with no prior knowledge of its mechanics. Elsewhere in her memoirs, Keller describes putting her fingers against her mother's mouth, against vibrating surfaces and feeling the cat purr or the dog bark. She was able to appreciate music by touching the piano or by feeling the airwaves in front of a singer's mouth. 
One of Keller's teachers reminisces about her lying on the floor of a church, experiencing the resonant notes of the church organ with her whole body. Keller's tactile perception of sound made her fingers and occasionally her whole body as sensitive as an eardrum, transforming different body parts into tactile resonant sound chambers. The mechanics of sound that occur internally become externalized for her and augmented. For Keller, everything had a texture and a vibration. So everything had a character and could be read as a sound language, experienced through the sense of touch. Even abstract ideas, thoughts, and mental processes had a direct and tactile sensory side. Keller's ability to scale, measure, and a proportion the subtleties of texture articulated the vast and untapped connection between senses and the environment. Uh, Perception Has Got to Have a Body is a chapter on Helen Keller or Arakawa, which is a book written by Madeline Gaines that presents Keller's entire body as perception that was fundamentally uh, an action, not something that one has as it was constructed on the spot. This articulation of perception as embodied and of perception as an action allowed Arakawa and Gaines to think of the body as fundamentally sighted and a co-originator of all sides as it's the locus of all perception. Conceptualizing a chimera of body and environment, uh, they describe the organism person environment, that's one giant word, uh, that is the encounter that creates the subjectivity of the person or another neologism that they use, the organism that persons. As they explain in the same way that a person can flex their body and their muscles, they can also flex the surrounding environment as well, which is both with them and of them at all times. In the way they describe the scale of this encounter and the definition of one's limits, they introduce uh, a neologism that is landing tides, which is heavily based on the testimonies of Keller on how she experienced sound through texture in different scales. Trying to establish her limits, her body's reach through sound, Keller was trying to answer where does voice comes from? And that is uh, Keller as imagined by Madeline Kintz. It's not an actual Keller quote. Uh, voice comes from head to foot, out the fingers of the right hand, with a lot of talk hanging around the wrist and a light march of it down through the whole length of the middle of the forearm. Arakawa and Gaines studied the life and ways of Helen Keller as an exemplary figure that could effortlessly coordinate between person, body, and the world. Her awareness was sighted, and in her process of navigating the world, she embodied landing sites. Landing sites affirm all awareness as both being sighted and spatial. They are uh, coordinated strategic assemblages of parts of bodies and their immediate environment, Encounters that produce consciousness. So they divided them in <laughs> perceptual imaging and dimensionalizing landing sites. I will not go into great detail, but I'll just say a few things about each of them. The first are the raw, uncalculated, the swell of perception, the actual point of focus, uh, the perceptual ones, that was. The imaging ones are that generalize, generalize on the perceptual ones. So filling in the gaps, extend the surfaces and imagining the volumes behind the surfaces. They were more based on previous experience and memory. The dimensional, dimensionalizing ones uh, are hooking up on the environment itself. So they're actually registering location and position relative to the environment. They engineer depth by reading volumes and dimensions. And at the end is what allows one to navigate a space. Like all perception, as they described through the landing sites term, is both a mental and a physical process. So landing sites can be understood as a strategic parsing of one, oneself into the encounters one has with their environment and the perceptive signals produced by such encounters that are later interpreted as world making. These are the mental physical constructions that hold the architecture that holds them. This apportioning of the world is a result of a neologism they produce, which is to cleave, meaning to adhere, connect, and simultaneously cut apart. That was the function of landing sites, to continuously produce a mapping of someone's perception through connecting and separated sites of impact. Again this, again, this process was inspired by Keller, who imagined the world as thick and continuous. 
Uh, Keller, as imagined by Madley Gins, and then this, the following thing is a quote. All surfaces flow or walk into one culminating thickness. Induction tells me I endlessly deduce. Characteristic of the sense of sight is a constant slicing up of the world into separate parts at seemingly some... Nope. Um, Characteristic of the sense of sight is a constant slicing up of the world into separate parts, as seemingly some removed from the ongoing sensing. Not at all how it is with the sense of touch. Sight cleaves apart thing from thing and person from thing. That is why Merleau-Ponty called it the fragmentary sense. Those not having this cutting off maneuver available to them, those lacking all cutoff points, must live in a world that remains all of its own thickness, one that moves always through its own texture as its own texture, more immersed than immersed in its own self-sameness. Through the term cleave, Gins and Arakawa wanted to privilege embodied perception over the zeitgeist of interpretation that was popular in their time, and nowadays, actually. Uh, through this process of cleaving, dividing, and then bringing together, the duo understood the body and its environment as actively co-constituting one another. This would counter the idea of automaticity, or to use uh, Ahmed's term, would be a way to deviate from the inner straightening devices that are cultural, social, but also biological, in a sense that the ability to generalize could overpower your ability to empirically perceive what is there. As much of the Western culture has long uh, been predominantly visual, the sense of sight has come to override the other senses and to take on the status of the primary mode of perception. However, for Keller, any spatial configuration was constructed only tentatively, as her perception worked against the striating powers of images that tend to domesticate it. <coughs> Keller's orientation had to be built anew with every environmental cue, and her auditory perception was augmented by its tactility, swelling up with meanings that could not be articulated within language. Keller's perception might thus be said to come before reason or other established regimes of thought could lay any claim to her knowledge production. In Helen Keller or Arakawa, Madeline Gins dives into Keller's perspective modalities through describing her process, finding parallels between her intuitive use of language in her own poems and in Arakawa's abstract painting practice. Keller's embodied experience of language caught the attention of Gins, as she herself was interested in unleashing the mechanism of meaning through the structuralism of language. For Keller, the experience of language became a bodily affair, as he described that everything had a name, and its name gave birth to a new thought. Every object which I touched seemed to quiver with life. It's interesting here to refer to two moments from Keller's life when she understood not just what language means, but what language does for her. And that's a two uh, short quotes. That's from her actual biography. We walk down the path to the well house, attracted by the fragrance of the honeysuckle with which it was covered. Someone was drawing water and my teacher placed my hands under the sp uh, spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole att attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly I felt a mystic consciousness as of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R, water, meant the wonderful cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. And this was even more evident with abstract ideas. So that's another quote. Today I was stringing beads of different sizes in symmetrical groups. Two large beads, three small ones, and so on. I made many mistakes, and Miss Sullivan pointed them out again and again with gentle patience. Finally, I noticed a very obvious error in the sequence, and for an instant, I concentrated my attention on the lessons and tried to think how I should have arranged the beach. Uh, Miss Sullivan touched my forehead and spelled with decided emphasis, think. In a flash, I knew that the word was the name of the process that was going on in my head. Because Keller came in contact with language in an older age, and because her grappling of the world was deprived of sense of sight and hearing, Language for her played a very important role in making mental maps, going from experience to a model of the world. <laughs>
Madeline Gaines envisioned Keller as a living canvas, drawing a parallel between Arakawa's abstract painting practice and its tentative approach to meaning making, and Keller's perceptual organs as points in space, coming together through proprioception and kinesthesia, forming her body as a space between two or three points. Keller's process of embodied perception and its cited spatial character, as well as the extension of what could be conceived as body proper through encounters with her environment, became the pillars of Arakawa and Gaines' practice, moving from a series of artworks uh, for museum exhibitions and culminated in several full-scale architectural constructions. So Gaines and Arakawa had been working for years with no less production and the mechanics of signification through the human faculties. For Keller, knowledge was a bodily affair, making language and meaning embodied and therefore divorced from the tyranny of representation. With their enormous painting series, The Mechanism of Meaning, that went on for almost 40 years, uh, Gins and Arakawa aimed to make visible the mechanics of perception. They carried out an archaeology of the process of meaning making, attempted to raise awareness of the events that matter, the encounters that leave an imprint on our perception trying to move it outside of its autopilot mode. In their exhibition and book, the duo deconstructed the ways in which meaning is created via a series of how-to guides that question the primacy of vision and the, dom uh, the dominance of the thinking faculties. From the abstract painting of Arakawa that were to be seen, they moved to three-dimensional enterable texts to be, sorry, experience with one's whole body. Every painting was a puzzle of meaning to be solved without one solution, through an interplay of scale, perceptual immersion, and reflexive thinking. That was uh, Madeline Gein's contribution as a writer and poet. With titles such as uh, Neutralization of Subjectivity, Presentation of Ambiguous Zones, Degrees of Meaning, Meaning of Scale, Texture of Meaning, or Texture of Cognition, they attempted to open up the concept of meaning by unpeeling all its layers. With a mapping of meaning, for example, they tried to consider that any representation of a system may be used as a map when paired with or put against an object or an environment. In a way, they attempted to create a representation, a map of the, me uh, a map of the mapping of meaning itself. Uh, in their later work, they created tactically posed surrounds that would make ex explicit the dispersal of landing sites and thus affirmed the um, sightedness of awareness. They compared architectural procedure with built discourse, posing questions by constructing environments through scalar operations, using architectural spaces as phrases, sentences, and texts. Uh, they argued that surroundings can pose questions by virtue of how their elements and features are posed. Architectural procedures, through the way they are experienced in different scales, they have their internal logic, and like the logic of a language requires a certain kind of shared meaning, but it could always provide an excess. Gintz and Arakawa believed that the totality of perception could be a proportion in infinite worlds and therefore always produce an excess of meaning, attempting to follow Keller's advice, seeking to construct the world anew each day. This construction of the world was thought out in all of their work, from the text objects of Madeline Gins to the abstract paintings of Arakawa to the enterable text painting installations of Mechanism of Meaning to their architectural works. From the production of a model of thought, they went to map out a field of sensibility, making the reader of the text of the work an active user and someone that participates not just on the reading but on the construction of the text. So what is pertinent in their work, and this is how I'm concluding, uh, is that they used it as a way to unpuzzle meaning making and then as a way to unpuzzle the nature of the puzzle creatures that we are. The shift from the mechanism of meaning to their architectural work was based on Keller's experience of perception, not as something given, but as intuited and constructed on the spot. And in their work, they tried to surpass automaticity by first acknowledging the infinite scales that perception acts upon, and second, by recognizing the tentativity of the process uh, focusing at the same time in the undoing and an unholding of the automaticity, but also in all the queer ways to hold the world in place. Arakawa and Gins, despite the fact that they didn't deal with sound as in the sense of hearing or speaking, they understood that the perception of sound is material and that contributed to their spatial materialist philosophy and practice. As Tamlidge in the introduction, 
They demonstrate that context is everything, and for them, all context leads to the architectural context newly conceived. Thank you.